Welcome to Grace Gospel Fellowship Sunday morning Bible study. And this morning we're getting in tune. Give me one moment here. Okay. We're going to be in Philippians 4. Last week we, we saw that the foundation of it is from Isaiah 26. And we're talking about a transcend, transcendent peace that is available to every Christian, utilized by the few. I, am I echoing? How's that? Better? And um, the purpose of this piece uh, is not individual. I, I say that um, uh, because, again, in the American church, we, we are so inclined to believe that our relationship to the Lord is a one-on-one -on -one relationship, and certainly we do, we do have that, but we are part of a family, and I think a lot of the times when the Bible's speaking um, of the whole, we apply it to, this, to, the, to the part, and I think we're poor for it. So today I want to talk to you about peace and peacemaking, and, I, and I've entitled this Get, Getting in Tune. Let's just begin with the passage that we want in, in Philippians chapter 4. And I think today we've established enough um, the foundation we could begin right in, in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, this is like a, a doctor's prescription. So if, if this is something that you need to work on in your life, you, you could even write it down on a three by five card and post it up, keep it in your purse, uh, make it a, a daily prayer multiple times. Of course, this isn't the only section in the Bible that talks about the peace of God. There, there are others, but this is a very helpful section. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all people. Uh, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the shalom of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts, will garrison your hearts and your minds in Messiah Yeshua. Um, the finally brothers actually goes with this, but I'm going to leave that out for now and probably take that up next week. Uh, but uh, uh, in your Bibles, and I hope you do mark your Bibles, I give you a dispensation to risk the blasphemy and heresy to mark uh, God's word. I, I would hope you have in, in, in Christ or in Messiah Yeshua marked. Because if you remember back to Isaiah 26, it's in the Lord that we have peace there too. Um, Perfect peace is dependent on the mind that is fixed, the mind that is occupied with God. And so when we become distracted, that's when we become vulnerable. And really, you can boil our lives down to um, whether we are motivated and inspired by fear or by love. And you'd be surprised how much of our life is based on fear. And this is why we're told over and over in the Bible, fear, fear not. And we're told that the spirit of fear is not a gift of God. So it's coming from somewhere else. Now it can emanate from anywhere where of a number of places. I, I know scripture labels at least three. Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So our circumstances... Uh, the world climate that has been set and uh, our, our old nature is sufficient enough to distract us. And so these are, these are three things that we have to daily battle, but we have been given surpassing strength by the God who raised his son up from the grave. And um, 
when we do fail, it's because we're not utilizing the gifts we've already been given. Jesus said, and we, we brought this up in the past, he says to a group of men, I have spoken these things. This is John 16, 33. You have it in your notes. I have spoken these things to you so that you might have peace in me. It's in me, again, as in Messiah Yeshua. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so there are a number of truths here listed, and they're kind of listed in binary. I, I wrote uh, years ago that the power to overcome life in this fallen world rests in Christ. The power to overcome life in this fallen world rests in Christ, and that is both in our union, our standing with Christ, and in our communion, our state with, in, in Christ. Our standing is perfect, our state ebbs and flows. Um, I have spoken these things to you so that you might have peace. Uh, Jesus has spoken these words. They might be repeated by others, even by men who aren't Christians. They might be seconded by people who aren't even Christians, and yet they, um, they, they are honored by men um, uh, where their philosophy actually harmonizes with that which Christ brings. But it's not human wisdom. They're tipping their hat to something. I see that now if you watch, if you're a fan of Jordan Peterson, and I have mixed feelings about him, but if you're a fan of Jordan Peterson, I, I am, uh, when you see him debate somebody like Sam Harris, I almost think, and I was saying this to somebody Thursday night, that there's a danger with Jordan Peterson that goes beyond that of Sam Harris. Sam Harris is just an overt, hostile, angry atheist. But Jordan Peterson is somebody who um, reverences uh, the Bible, not as the Word of God, but kind of as a, a, uh, a, an articulate Aesop's fables. And so Peterson comes to the Word of God and says, you're missing out on this, Sam. They're, the morals of these stories, the, the archetypes that are mentioned here, uh, can help lead to a fulfilling life. I almost said it, he's an articulate and intellectual Joel Olstein. Uh, but the one thing I do love about Jordan Peterson is people who have never picked up the Word of God before are picking it up because he's... he's, he's um, He's revering it in, 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 his, um, in his lectures and so forth. How did I get on that? Anyone want to draw me back? Um, the power to overcome life in this fallen world rests in Christ, both in our union, our standing in Christ, and in our communion, our state in Christ. I have spoken these things to you so that you might have peace. So this is Jesus speaking, and he's... Uh, spoken to us that we might have peace. So um, let us first notice that Christ tells his disciples that his words can bring them peace. His words. Some people reduce Christianity to a philosophy, and yet here it is a divine philosophy. Jesus isn't rebuking that idea. Um, he's not talking about some magical, mystical moment that w happens to you when you become a believer where some invisible angel sprinkles dust on you. And it's a magical fairy dust that realigns your soul with his. That doesn't happen. It's not in Scripture. Now, I know religion speaks that language. Religion makes it seem like it's that easy or so, there's some kind of spiritual osmosis we can park a Bible under our pillow and lay on it, and somehow through spiritual osmosis we'll have perfect peace. But no, we find out throughout Scripture in both Testaments that perfect peace is related to our fixation. <clears throat> Forgive me for the negative connotations of the word obsession, but our obsession with the person and work of Christ and with his words as if a child is sitting at the knee of his father who's telling a story and we're delighting in it. You've all seen that, I hope, that YouTube. Uh, there's this wonderful, 
And I thank God for YouTube. There, there, there we go. That's a prayer you can pray every day. Thank you for YouTube. I know it's a blessing and a curse. But there's a wonderful short video of a, I think it's a Dutch shepherd. And he's having some fun with friends who are visiting. And they're standing at this fence. And there's this huge flock out in front of them. And they're, they're dispassionately uh, ignoring the humans. And he tells his friends to call the flock in. And he even tells them the words to say to call them in. And they don't budge. They don't move. They don't even lift up their heads. <laughs> and he, he lets each one give it a try. And they, they do it to varying degrees of enthusiasm. And then finally, when he's done having his fun, he calls them. And it's like a shotgun goes off because they come running to their master. They come running, and it's jubilant. And it's, it's just a wonderful expression. And I don't think this was even his intention. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. But when, when I saw it, to me, it was a wonderful illustration of my sheep hear my voice. Delight, delight in it. You know, and that, that, goes, that goes two ways. That goes two ways. Um, I was uh, treated to something again this week, even though it's old, but every time I watch it, I, I'm filled with joy. And I'm going to share it with you in a moment. It's a short video, but before I do, I, I want to mention that, that this, is, this is not unique. It's happened before to, to other musicians. And there's even a legend of Beethoven. I remember in college, uh, my professor who was teaching um, classical music, um, he, he related a le legend, a number of legends about Beethoven. A couple of them I really love. One was when he was young. You know, his father was very abusive and uh, very strict and, and an alcoholic. And at one point, um, Beethoven's father came home late at night reveling with the gang. And um, they were making a bunch of noise. And I think he was five or six and he was trying to sleep. And uh, they were drinking. And they ran out of booze, and so they went back out of the house to, to find <laughs> more bottles. But as they were reveling, somebody was at the piano, playing the piano, and when the father said, we're bone dry, let's go look for some more drink, the guy didn't finish the phrase on the piano. He left it hanging. He didn't return to tonic. He didn't resolve the, the, the phrase that he was playing at the time. And all of a sudden you hear the, the feet on the wooden floor and you hear the door shut behind and then there's complete quiet in the house. And Beethoven's angry and he pulls up his blanket and uh, he's laying there. And then finally, out of frustration, he throws his blanket off and he walks downstairs and he sits at the piano and he jams down the tonic core <laughs> to resolve it. And then he goes back up and goes to bed. He couldn't sleep without that being resolved. That's probably a legend. This one might be too. It might be apocryphal. But it's told that in the last few months of his life, you know, when his health really deteriorated before, I think he, I think he passes away in his own apartment in his mid-50s, somewhere along that. But his health in, in, in his... 57. 57, there we go. And his health in the later years was bad. You know about his hearing and so forth. And um, he, was, he was walking home at one point, and he got caught in a thunderstorm, so the story goes. And this is just months before he passes. And uh, it was a severe storm, and he was looking to get out of the storm, and he sees a small cottage along the side of the road, and the lights are on. And uh, he sees glimmering light through the window. And so he approaches the cottage, and he knocks on the door, hoping these people will at least take him in until the rain stops. And it's already dark, and they take him in, and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a farmer and his daughter. It's, it's just a poor man and his daughter, and it's, it's a one-room cottage, but they have a piano in it, <laughs> right? And so uh, they see this, um, this sickly man who's, who's you know, rain-driven and wind blown into their home. So the, the older man goes to get some towels and, and, and puts on some tea, hot tea, and he tells his daughter to sit down and play. Now this is all before they really realize that this guy is deaf. 
and the daughter is playing the piano while the old man's making the tea and he's looking at his guest who's drying off with the towels. And he speaks to his guest and um, uh, Beethoven communicates that he's, he can't, he, he, he doesn't understand because he's deaf. And so then the old man says something to the daughter, like stop playing, and Beethoven interrupts and says, no, please play. But he doesn't recognize what she's playing. He can't hear it. And uh, the old man's a little bit um, befuddled, you know, I mean, a deaf guy, and he wants her to continue. But Beethoven dries off his hair, and he approaches the piano, and he puts his ear down. And he listens. And as he's listening, a small smile breaks out on his face. And then he lifts his head up, and he breaks out into tears. Because she's playing Beethoven. She's playing his music. I don't know if that story is true or not, but I love it. It's been precious to me since I, was, uh, since I first heard it. So this just happened recently with, with another European musician. He was on an airplane, and there was a teen girl sitting next to him. I never heard of this guy before. Dayton is his name. And um, he's tweeting as this is happening. And he tweets out, uh, the girl next to me on the plane is playing my album. <laughs> and they're chit-chatting back and forth. And she doesn't recognize who he is. <laughs> so she says, what do you do? And he doesn't want to tell her, well, I wrote that, what you're listening to. He doesn't want to do that. So he plays with her a little bit. He says, well, I'm a musician. I write music. And they carry on this conversation, and he's dropping hints as they, you know, four-hour plane ride. And, and he's tweeting as, they're, as the half hour goes by. He's saying, she's still listening, hasn't, doesn't have a clue. Maybe she follows me on Twitter, and she'll read this. And it's going on and on. So finally, one of his Twitter people says, you should write her a little note um, so she knows who she was sitting next to. So he does this. He writes her a little note, and, and, um, and they say goodbye. And he gives her the note, and he goes away. And, the, and she later reads it, and she's uh, uh, horror-struck that she didn't recognize her hero. Uh, because as they're sitting on the plane, she mentions to him how important the music has been to her and her mother because I think her mother got divorced and it helped them get through that. And at one point, she even gives him her earphones and says, listen to this, isn't it beautiful? And I thought of the Beethoven moment, right? And he said, it must have been the greatest compliment in the world to this man who's composed this music and this girl next to him isn't just entertained by it, but she was so moved it got her through a difficult, a difficult emotional period. So later she writes him an embarrassment in email and he invites her and her mom to a concert and it all works out well. Well, what you are about to see, I'm going to share with you just because it's fun and it's Sunday and we should have a little fun. This is old. It's, it, it might be a year or two old. Um, and it's a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this fella. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, when you see him, he looks homeless. <laughs> but when you're a millionaire, you can dress like this, this chill. Um, I, I saw somebody say, my goal in life is to be as chill as Modest Yahoo. So Modest Yahoo is kind of, um, he's a devout Jew. He's a practicing Jew. And he writes um, reggae, hip-hop music. And uh, he has just shaved his beard. He had like this long Hasidic beard at one point. And now he doesn't have it. He shaved it. But he's in Hawaii, and he goes to get a drink in, um, in, in a cafe, a, a coffee house in Maui. And he walks in, and there's a kid playing the ukulele. And the, the kid is playing a song called One Day. Uh, this song, if you listen to it, you might think it's, it's a New Age song or it's uh, like a peacenik song until you realize that it's a Jew writing about what will happen when Messiah comes, right? He's writing about the peace of the kingdom, that one day, you know, the Palestinians and the Jewish children will all play together and there won't be any more war. 
and so forth. So I love the song because we both believe that the Messiah is going to return and bring peace. The only difference between me and Mattis Yao is I believe he's been here already. Um, and so that, that's the nature of this song, One Day. I sing it with Peyton at home. We sing this song together. And um, so this is a short little clip from this coffee house in Maui. And the ukulele player, his name is Clint, um, his Hawaiian name is Kakoa, but it's Clint Alama. And he has no idea who's standing there and breaks in singing with him. So this is the clip. the end but he finishes the song and Maris Yahoo says to him um, well actually he says to Maris Yahoo hey man you got a great voice <laughs> and um, and then Maris Yahoo says to him do you know who wrote that song and he says Maris and, and he points to himself and he says I'm Maris Yahoo <laughs> And he says, oh, I didn't recognize you because he's just shaved his beard. I didn't recognize you. And they exchange greetings, and um, he invites him to the show that night. The story goes on. It's a wonderful story. Actually, the, the kid you saw playing the ukulele ac actually gets into some trouble. And he, um, because of a, a, a breach of uh, probation, he ends up in jail. And Modest Yahoo is doing a concert at the Hollywood Palladium in California, and he actually gets the judge to release him for the weekend to come sing with Mahdish Yahu on stage in Los Angeles. So it must have been a pretty cool judge, but it's, it's a wonderful story. But anyway, when I, I see that, I think to myself what it must be like for God to delight in his children when we're in harmony with him, when, when we're singing his song in life and he sees it. Because as a father, 
I've had this feeling when my children, you know, there's that wonderful verse by the, the beloved apostle John. He writes, um, uh, no, there's no greater joy than when a parent sees his children walking in the truth. Isn't that a beautiful verse? There's no greater joy. Now, now apply that to God the Father. Because we're told that we bring joy to our Father, that we were created for his pleasure. We know we can grieve the Holy Spirit, but we could also bring joy to um, God. Uh, but based on our, our behavior, our attitude, and I think he walks in our, our, our coffee shop sometimes, and I think he'll sing back up when we're singing his song. And so I hope now every time you see that, that it reminds you of, of that a little bit. And I want to get, de demonstrate how that works. You know, how that works with um, life. So um, time's running out, so let me try and get this in. Um, I'm reading a book now by a lawyer. And my list of lawyers I love and respect is now up to three. <laughs> and one of them's here. Um, but no, I think lawyers have been unfairly maligned. There are wonderful people out there that practice law. And this guy's one of them. But the story really is about two kids. So I want to introduce you to the first one. He's a Ugandan kid named Charlie. And I don't know if you know this about Uganda, but you, do you know the average age in Uganda? I know, you, you shouldn't know this unless you read the book. The, the average U, U, Ugandan age is 14. It is a nation of children. 14. And... Um, Charlie was a victim of a witch doctor. Um, in Uganda, there's still child sacrifice. And, and the, the witch doctors will, will, will grab children and will mutilate them. And there's also a budding trade for organs in Uganda. So people are often killed for, harvested for their organs, and it's sold on the black market. But Charlie was a victim of a witch doctor, and he was mutilated. And we, we're going to come back to Charlie, okay? We're going to come back to Uganda, but now I'm going to take you all the way across the globe to a different time to San Diego, California. Young kid. He's out in the woods uh, with a friend, and like boys will do, they're shooting at each other with BB guns. And they don't not like each other. They love each other. And they love this. So they got tired of shooting, you know, tin cans. So they decided, hey, why not shoot at each other? So on this particular afternoon, um, one boy, the guy with the pellet gun, shot the other boy in the belly. And it, it was, he pumped the gun too many times and it drew blood. And so they go home, and uh, the guy who got shot, his name is Bob. He's who I want to tell you about. And so Bob got shot in the belly, and they go home, and uh, um, his friend is tending to his wound, right? And I think he pours scope on it or something, you know, uh, and, and he's putting a Band-Aid on it. And I think the friend, because they're 15, I think the friend was worried that maybe his, uh, he, he, his Bob might die, right? So for the first time in their friendship, their friend, I'm going to call him Harvey, I forgot his name, but Harvey shares Christ with Bob. You know, kind of like, it's your deathbed, I, I, I might lose you, so let me tell you about Jesus. Well, Bob trusts the Lord, and, and he says, um, he says I, it really wasn't the words, it really was my friend. I loved my friend, and there was something about him that was different than everyone else. I, yeah, and even though he shot me in the stomach with a pelican. And he said, so I kind of went along just because I loved my friend, and I, I, he had something that I wanted. A year or two later, Bob is in high school, and he sees this other fellow. And Bob's an impressionable kid. He doesn't really have active parents in his life, but his grandparents are wonderful. Salt of the earth people, but they're not religious. 
you know, not religious people. And so he sees this older guy. Guy's got a beard and a motorcycle, and that's pretty cool. And he said, yeah, I'd like to have a beard and a motorcycle, but this guy isn't in our high school. He's already graduated, so he's kind of creepy. Why is he hanging out here, right? So he finally, he gets to know this guy, and he finds out the guy's not creepy. The guy's got a girlfriend, and he's hanging out at the high school because he's, he's a volunteer at this thing called Young Life, which is uh, a ministry um, to lead high school kids to the Lord. And so he forms this relationship with this guy, and he learns to admire him and um, really likes this guy. He's a few years older than him. But somehow, junior year, he got in his head that he hates high school. He's going to quit. And he's going to drive up to Yosemite, Yosemite Valley, and he's going to be a mountain climber. And he's going to get a job. And when he's not working, he's going to climb Al Capitan and Half Dome and all that, right? And so he goes to tell the one guy he loves and respects um, and looks up to as like a mentor. He goes to Randy's house, this guy with the beard and the motorcycle, Young Life. And he rings the doorbell, and Randy comes to the front porch, and he sees he, he like woke him up from asleep, right? Like Randy looks like he just got up, and it's like noon. It's kind of weird. But um, he's rubbing the sleep out of his eyes, and he, he looks like he you know, just woke up. And he tells him, he says, look, he said, uh, Randy, you know, this isn't for me. I really feel inclined to, you know, move to Yosemite and live out of my Volkswagen Beetle and work and, and be a mountain climber. And he says, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm leaving right now, and I'm going to go. And, and so Randy rubs the sleep out of his eyes. He said, wait a minute, you're leaving now. And he said, yeah. And he said, Could you, can you give me a minute? Can you wait a minute? Let me get, i got to get something. I want to show you something. So he says, sure. And Randy goes back into the house, and he's standing on the porch. Um, time goes by. It's kind of weird. Hand is in his pockets. He feels a little awkward, but he's got nothing to do. He just quit school. So he's uh, just hanging out. And all of a sudden, the screen door opens, and, and Randy comes out with this beat-up backpack and a sleeping bag. And his first thought was, oh, he's going to give me this stuff. But then Randy says to him, Bob, I'm with you. <laughs> and Bob says, what? And he says, yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm going with you. Um, and Randy says, you're going to come with me to Yosemite? And, and I'm sorry, Bob says that. And Randy says, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with you, and don't worry about it. I'll drive with you. I'll get you situated, and then I'll find my way home. And he's surprised, but he says, oh, great. He, he, he'd love the company, and this, this is the one guy he really looks up to. So they jump in a car, and they drive to Yosemite, and they get there at night. And they don't have a tent. They only have, you know, sleeping bags. And so they see one of these big tents set up for like the next day for some kind of festivity. And they sneak in the back of it, and no one's in there. But they sleep at the very back in case somebody comes in, they could, they could scram. So they sleep in this tent, uh, and they wake up to a chill morning. Uh, they come outside. It's beautiful. They boulder for a little bit and talk for the day, and then... You know, then it's time to find work. So they drive into the valley, and Bob applies everywhere. And everywhere he goes is the same thing. Uh, there's no, no work for you here. Right, we got nothing for you, right? And he's really disappointed because <laughs> he applied everywhere. And, and at the one place, um, he felt a spark of, of hope. The manager stood there and let him fill out the whole application. And the moment he finished it, he handed, handed it to the manager, and the manager handed it back to him and said, we're not hiring. <laughs> That's a sadist right there, right? But, um, so, so they go back to Yosemite, and they spend another night, and they get up the next day, and he goes, well, I, I better go straight to look for work because, you know, the mountains aren't going anywhere, but we're almost out of money. And so he goes to look for work again. And finally, a shop owner says to him, look, kid, we're in a depression right now here. I mean, I can't even give my kid a job in my own store. There's no work in the valley. 
And he, he looks in his pockets and he realizes he barely has enough money to pay for gas to get home. So he goes to Randy and he says, look, Randy, uh, it's not working out. I can't find a job. And I think maybe we should turn around and go home. And Randy says to him, Bob, whatever you need, man, I'm with you. If you decide to stay, I'm, I know you can do it. I know you got it in you. But if you want to go home, I'm with you on that, too. So they drive home. They drive home. And, and Bob goes to drop Randy off at his house midday. And he helps him carry his stuff in. And even though Randy doesn't invite him in, he follows him in. And they, they get into the front room. And Bob looks around. And, and there's all these boxes. And they're like, he's not sure if they're being packed or unpacked. Right? But he could tell that Bob's not moving because the boxes don't look like moving boxes. As a matter of fact, he sees wrapping paper everywhere, like it's been somebody's birthday or Christmas and all these things are unwrapped. And he's trying to figure out what's going on with all these boxes when from around the corner comes Randy's girlfriend and she jumps into his arms and kisses him and says, I've missed you, honey. And what Bob finds out is that Randy had just gotten married. And they didn't go on a honeymoon, but this was like two days after they got married when Bob showed up on his porch. And for a second, he was horror-stricken, right? Because he had interrupted their, their wedding week. And then he thought to himself, wow. He never had parents. He had grandparents, but he, he said to himself, I never felt more worth in my life than I did at that moment because Randy showed me a love I had never known. So that's when Christ like became real for him. It wasn't just, I like my friend who shot me in the belly. He said he actually saw Christ in Randy. Now, why do I bring this up to you? The mountain climber who quit high school, well, he went back and finished, and then he went to law school, and then he became a lawyer with a really successful firm, uh, dozens of people who work for him. Uh, he became very wealthy, and, um, and um, at one point, he ends up in Uganda. And uh, he knows some of the judges there. He's trying to help. He's there as a Christian, on a Christian mission. And he realizes this fact that I shared with you, that the average age of, people, of somebody living in Uganda is 14. And he looks around and he doesn't see any men around. And, and it's the women and children are like exposed and vulnerable and and he, he he he's asking what's going on and he finds out that in Uganda if you want to get somebody sent to prison all you have to do is claim that they defiled your daughter and they have to do a four-year term no evidence just based on the father's claim and so in Uganda if your father if if the father doesn't like a certain boyfriend he could be sent to prison for four years, just even if he didn't do anything. So he begins to look into this, and he goes to one of the judges there, and he says, you know, this is insane. A lot of these cases I'm looking at, these guys didn't do anything. There was no, there was no corroborating evidence, no nothing. Just the father said this. And so he says, Let's, can we try some of these cases? And, and the, the judge, his friend, says, yeah, sure, why not? And so, you know, because law is different in Uganda. Mike, you're going to appreciate this. He said he bought the whole library of Ugandan law, both books. <laughs> and he read it, and then he took these 80 cases in front of a judge. 79 of them were dismissed. And these young teenage men were able to go home to their families and help their families farm and, and produce and so forth. But then he found out about the witch doctors and how he was seeing people that were mutilated. He was hearing about people that were killed children 
killed because of their organs being sold on the black market. And he runs into Charlie. This little boy, this little black boy was mutilated. And he finds out which, which, which doctor did it. And he goes to the judge again, who now he's become an annoyance to. And he says, you know, two years ago, you guys put this law out that says this is illegal. You know, capital crime. How come no one's doing anything? And the judge says, because everyone fears the witch doctors and what will happen to them if they come out against the witch doctors. And Bob says, well, I don't fear them. <laughs> I'm a Christian. <laughs> Uh, and I'm an American, so let's bring a case. And he said he couldn't find a judge that would take the case. He found one scrappy judge that was willing to do it, and they brought a case against this doctor, and he was convicted and sentenced to life. And that kind of sent a message in Uganda, right? Now, if that was the end of the story, wouldn't it be a wonderful story? But he got a call from a doctor he'd never met. The story was put out in some Christian magazine. He got a call from a doctor he never met, head of surgery at Cedar sinai And this doctor said, um, Bob, I know you don't know me, but I can fix Charlie. <laughs> and Bob said, I don't think you know what they cut off. And he said, no, I know, and I can fix him. And so he flies to Cedar sinai he meets with this doctor, and he says, they're in a restaurant, and the doctor's sketching stuff on a napkin. And he was hoping, like, the, the waitress or the manager wouldn't walk by because it, it was pretty graphic, and they'd think horrible things. Um, but he, he, the guy convinced him he could do it. And Bob says to him, this is going to cost a lot, right? And he said, oh, you wouldn't believe what it's going to cost. But I'm going to do it for free. So they fly Charlie in. And he does a number of surgeries, because it takes more than one. And you think, wow, if this is the end of the story, what a wonderful testimony to Christ, right? But it's not the end of the story. And now I want to share something with you I've shared with you before. It's out of an Anglican prayer liturgy, OK? And this is the quote. I think you have it in the tape room. Here's the quote, though, if you don't, about peacemaking. Peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. It is the act of interrupting injustice without mirroring injustice. The act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight, but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. Now, this is the line I want you to marinate, let marinate. It is about a revolution of love that is big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressors free. It is about a revolution of love that is big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressors free. Right, stop here. And let me finish the story, or at least take it as far as where it is currently. What does that mean in the situation between Charlie and the witch doctor, Kobe, who's serving life in prison. Well, Bob, being a good Christian man, understands this, and he says, uh, I want to do more than be a Christian lawyer in Uganda. And so he asks the general counsel of Uganda if he can orchestrate a meeting that would bring all the witch doctors in the area together. <laughs> and he does it. And he speaks to the witch doctors and he said, I'm the guy who just put that guy away for life, Kobe. But I'm not here to threaten you. Um, and he does say, if you continue this practice, you will see me in court. But I'm here to listen to you. What is it that you need? What is it that you want? Well, they, after a whole afternoon of talking with this, these witch doctors, he finds out that they want to learn how to read. So, Bob, because he can afford to, um, 
starts a school in Uganda for witch doctors. <laughs> yeah. uh, not to teach them the witch doctor stuff, <laughs> to teach them other stuff. And so these witch doctors enroll in his school, and he writes, he, by the way, he's written two bestsellers. I recommend both to you. I'm halfway through the second one. But uh, one is called Love Does, and um, another one is called Everybody All the Time. And Everybody All the Time is his Christian motto. Uh, in other words, he says it's real easy for Christians to love some of the people some of the time, but Christ calls us to love everybody all the time, and that's where the title comes from. So uh, yeah, one of the covers of his books has a bunch of thumbprints on it, and those thumbprints are ink prints of the thumbs of the witch doctors that he's teaching English. So this is what's meant here by not just a Christian who treats the oppressed, but who treats the oppressor. And why did this happen? Fundamentally, this happened because a kid got shot in the belly with a pellet gun. And because a youth mentor of a young kid was willing to waste two days of his honeymoon showing love and support and worth to a kid that he didn't think would make it. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. So when I'm speaking to you about peace, most of the time you hear about the peace of God in church, it's, it's so that we may have peace. Isn't that what Jesus said? Yes. But it's not for us to consume alone. Our joy and our peace that we derive from being in Christ is meant to be spent prodigally, generously, with a, magnet, with a magnanimity that would make God smile. This is what it means to get in tune with the harmony of God's spirit. It means that our heart begins to beat. This is from Philippians. Paul's prayer to the Philippians, that our heart pulses with the very pulse of Christ. As Peter says, that when we think, we think with the, the mind of Christ, but that our very words are as the oracles of God that our hands and our feet have been purchased not merely to carry us through life, but to be, as Mother Teresa said, the pencil in the hand of God. Let him write the story. I just want to be the pencil. So I, I guess I want to take you beyond the thinking that um, this, the peace of God is simply for our own consumption. It, it's like when, when God talks about love in Scripture, um, he's, he's saying that your love pours through your heart to others. In other words, we are the moon, and he is the sun, and the glory of the moon is in its reflection. So here we are. I have spoken these things to you that you might have peace. The in me, in this passage, I have spoken these things to you so that you might have peace. In me, in the world you shall have tribulation. Some people cross that out of their theology. I mentioned, I don't want to pick on Joel Osteen. I think many people probably come to the Lord through Joel and he'll probably be way in front of me in the Lord's triumph, but sometimes he's accused of kind of scratching out the awkward parts of the whole counsel of God. And um, certainly the prosperity gospel often um, at least implies that. But no, Jesus basically says to a group of men whom he just told what's going to happen to them, <laughs> uh, that they can have peace. How, how outrageous this is. Do you realize how outrageous this is? 
He's speaking to a group of guys whom he just said, yeah, I mean, with the exception of maybe the guy who's following me right now, um, you're all going to die the death in a manner that I do. They're going to rip you out of synagogues. They're going to beat you. They're going to stone you. They're going to do this all thinking they're doing the work of God. This is going to happen to you. But be of good cheer. <laughs> you know, there's certain passages in Scripture that should bother you. <laughs> uh, if they don't, you're not paying attention. You're not really grasping it. When you read that Jesus says to us, I send you out as sheep among wolves, if you've ever seen a National Geographic episode that shows a sheep and a wolf, that should bother you. Right? <laughs> what does he mean by that? It's not a whitewash. In the world you shall have tribulation. What if, you know, people have different degrees of it. I was thinking this morning um, about our children. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be a much better question to ask our children, who do you want to be? Instead of what do you want to be? I don't know about you as a child, but as a child, I wanted to be a number of things. A policeman, a fireman, a pro football player, all those things. Lots, life gets in between sometimes. And you're not able to accomplish that. But life can't get between who you want to be. That's between you and the Lord. Circumstances can't affect that. They can't steal that. Think of how what I want to be can be stolen from you. We live in the most prosperous country in world history where we have a lot of potential for advancement, a lot of opportunity here. If you're in India, you're in a caste system. You have no opportunity. The vast amount of people who have lived on planet Earth have not had an opportunity to mobily move between financial levels. The vast majority of people who live on planet Earth have not had a choice in who they'd marry. But who do you want to be? Imagine if your hope and your peace was based on what I wanted to be. If you were living in 1930s Germany and Austria, and you were a Jew, and you could have all the talent in the world, and all of a sudden, the what you want to be is swept into a Nazi, um, a Nazi concentration camp or a Russian gulag. If your hope is in what I want to be, it's dashed and your life is over. And if you read Viktor Frankl, that's the reason so many people commit suicide in the camps. And his number one goal as a psychologist who was in the camp with them was to give them hope to live beyond the camp because their hopes had been shattered by circumstances. Corey Ten Boom, who lived in the camp, was more aware of the who I want to be than the what I want to be. You can read her story. As a matter of fact, Shana, our dear Shana, is going to lead a book group, like four or five weeks on it, on a Thursday night coming up. So the hiding place, if you want to get a jump on it. But what if we said to our children, who do you want to be, instead of what you want to be? That's a kind of person that whether, look at, look at the life of Joseph, if you want a biblical example. Look at the life of Joseph. <laughs> he was the honored of the father. The heir, pretty much. Um... And yet, all that was taken away. He was pitted, and then slaved, and then prisoned. So he went from the heir of a wealthy man to a victim, to a slave, to a convict. And if his hope was in what I want to be, he might have taken his life. He might have despaired of life as Jeremiah. 
But the who Joseph was, was able to overcome the circumstances. And I don't mean the end of the story. If he would have died in prison, he would have been an honor and a pleasure to his God. Because the who wasn't up to his brothers. The who wasn't up to his slave owners. The who wasn't up to the warden. The who wasn't up to the Pharaoh. The who was, here I am, Lord. What would you have me to do? The in me, in me, I have spoken these things to you so that you might have peace in me. You could really pray this verse and go word by word. Notice the word might. That's a scary word. It implies might not. And I got to tell you, the vast majority of Christians that, that, that live in any era might not. And you and I might not. This isn't an occasion of like you get it and you, you keep it, like the peace you have with God. It's fleeting. Remember Peter on the water. It's fleeting. Because it's dependent on our occupation with Christ. It's dependent on our joy being, being grounded and rooted in the Lord. It's dependent on having a thankful spirit. It's dependent on praying without ceasing and having the kind of intimacy with your Father that you take everything to His throne. All the bad thoughts too! I share Bono's frustration with Christian music. Bono says, have, have any of these kids playing bubblegum Christianity actually read the Psalms? Because none of that Christian music sounds anything like what David wrote. Because when David struggled, he wrote about it. You want to blow the typical Christian's mind? Tell him, read Psalm 42. The psalmist is screaming at the Lord. Where are you? Why have you abandoned me? We lose kids by the thousands because we have churches that have fortified a lie about Christianity. Saying that doubt is a lack of faith. David is a man after our Lord's own heart and he doubted all the time. John the Baptist doubted. We need to give a place for people who have doubt. We need to leave our honeymoon and go to Yosemite to give a place for our children who have doubt because we're losing them to a Pied Piper that is unnecessary. Because we want to whitewash the word of the Psalms. The in me you might have peace. I speak these words to you. They've been spoken to us. Do we hear his voice? That you might have peace in me. In the world you shall have tribulation. Differing degrees. Certainly uh, we have it much easier. And I say we as a whole, not you as an individual. You might be really struggling with something traumatic and deep. I don't want to lessen that. But when I say we, I mean the Western church that lives in prosperity and without hostility than we do. You just saw 42 Christians were just killed by Muslims. I know the, the, the focus of the world, rightly so, is on the Muslims that were killed by the maniac. But every week we lose Christians in Nigeria and Mosul and elsewhere. We just lost another 42. No one's talking about it. God knows. You should know. It should be part of our prayers. But it's harder to be a Christian in Mosul than it is to be a Christian in Bensonville. That's not taking away the burden you're carrying right now. I believe in your storm. I believe in it. So please don't think I'm diminishing you as an individual. I'm talking about us as a whole, overall. And right now, even your storm, the horrible storm you're going through, if you were transported from here to Mosul, it would be that much worse. All right. 
I've got my lights, so I've got to stop. But let, let me get to this. Let me just give you this. Ready? I've spoken these things to you that you might have peace, right? <clears throat> His words can bring these peace, but what of these words? Does he assure them of great prosperity in the physical realm? Of the approbation of their fellow man? Of the health of their bodies? Of the surety of their personal safety? Of social status? Of political impact? Of the absence of pain? And the abundance of pleasure? No, he's just told them that they will be scorned by their own brothers, publicly humiliated, dragged from the synagogues, killed by those who will actually believe they're doing the Lord's work. The in me is in direct contrast to the next statement in the world. In this particular case, there really are only two stores in town. There's Christ and there's Diabolos. Many times there is a third option or a fourth, and I know it's a debater's technique to convince you that there are usually only two options the unreasonable option of my opponent, and the common sense approach that I espouse, wink, wink. But um, either, for example, you've heard this, either we increase your taxes or school children will starve or the environment will be destroyed or our seniors will have to eat dog food out of a can so that they can afford prescription drugs. This is not that. This is that, not that kind of a ludicrous binary. But there are cases where there are only two options. Or in this case, two sources, right or wrong, true or false, costly or beneficial. In this statement, Christ is not building a straw man. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, some of us dismiss the grand stories that we grew up on. And, and I want to tell you that they're very biblical. When... When Milton was trying to decide on a topic for an epic poem, he wrote down, I think, a hundred different ideas. And he whittled it down to two. And the two he whittled it down to were the Garden of Eden, what he chose, and King Arthur. He was going to write an Arthurian myth with the same motive, to exalt Christ. Because he saw the story of King Arthur as a type of Christ, as, as a Christ story. And we've forgotten that. We've forgotten that the Arthurian tales are, are to promote Jesus. So we just see him as King Arthur, and now they make movies about it, and it's completely sapped of all the wealth, <laughs> right? But we also forget about Robin Hood. The story of Richard and John is the story of the usurper. And I was having this discussion with somebody the other day because many, many of you don't realize that. You should love Robin Hood. Uh, it's easy to love King Richard. King Richard is the real legitimate king. He's not on the throne. He's away fighting another battle, but he will come one day. And who are the righteous? The righteous are the ones hiding in the wood. It's a story of David, by the way, but the, the righteous are the ones hiding in the wilderness, the, the forest, Sherwood Forest. And what are they known as? The merry men. Christians are made, are called, are designed to be joyful warriors. Filled with joy. That's who God wants us to be. That's not always who we are. But that's who God wants us to be. And one day, right will, uh, wrong will be righted. And John will be dealt with. And Richard will take the throne. One day he'll return. Hopefully he catches us in a pub singing a song to Richard. All right. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So our joy is to be experienced in the present, even amid, amid suffering. Um, the, the joy of the disciples here, their joy is based on the victory that Christ has won. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. We can have joy in the midst of sorrow. This is not the stiff upper lip stoicism where you don't cry at your wife's funeral. That's not Christianity. That, to be honest with you, that's, 
that's not even Puritanism, even though people make it out to the Puritans <laughs> knew joy, right? But um, sometimes that's thought of as, as true Christianity, that we, we, we can't enjoy sexual relations with our wife or we can't have fun. I mean, this is a lie from Satan, right? We can have joy in the midst of sorrow, even when we are the focal point of hostility or adversity, if we know the keys to life and ministry. There are keys. There is a formula. Sometimes the hardest part, and you know this as a kid, is taking the medicine. Still with my daughter, I love her, she's nine, and she'll be, uh, have a fever or she'll have an earache and we'll try and administer medicine to her and she, she'd rather suffer than swallow the medicine. And we don't outgrow that. We, just, we might be able to take NyQuil or the pink stuff or whatever it is you're, you're, you're giving. We might have to still count to three to take it, but it just the medicine changes for adults, right? That Christ is the victor and our union with him makes us more than conquerors, super conquerors, from the Greek. And our communion with him renews our mind and transforms us to experience peace and joy and to produce fruit. So the strategic victory won by Christ at Calvary is the basis for all our provision, for all our enablement. I want to leave you with Jeremiah 17. This is verse 5 to 8 in Jeremiah 17. So says Jehovah... Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departs from Jehovah. Well, you say nobody does that. Oh, people do this all the time. The psychologists call it codependency. This happens in interpersonal relationships. This happens with people we idolize. This happens with politicians. Put not your trust in princes. Some people are crushed when... when when their side loses an election. Um, we, put, we put a lot of faith in men that, that is only deserved of God. Now, by the way, this is not saying you shouldn't trust anyone. This is not some kind of uh, advice from, uh, you know, <sighs> help me, Luke, um, the mafia boss in a Bronx tale. Uh, see, when you're put on the spot, you sometimes forget. But this is not some mafia advice, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. This is, it's, it's not that. It's not saying you can't trust anyone, go through life without trusting anyone. This is like when the Lord says, you know, if you truly love me, you, you have to hate mother and father. He's not saying hate mother and father. This is a prioritization. It's not an either or. Right? So Jeremiah says this, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departs from Jehovah. See, I hate to say this, but over and over we're told in the Bible you can't serve two masters. You can't have both. If your trust is first and foremost in your fellow man and in movements, even, by the way, in, in small c Christianity, even in religion, you know, you're fighting the culture war and you think Christians are going to win the culture war? We've never been promised that in the Bible at all. But, I mean, your whole hope is in that. Um, some kind of false or superficial or shallow Christianity. And then your hopes are dashed. That wasn't a promise to you. For he shall be like a juniper in the desert and shall not see when good comes but he shall live in the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land that is not inhabited. So the first part's negative, right? The man who puts his trust in man, your heart will depart from Jehovah. Some of our thieves of peace are just welcomed into our house. The person who has um, cable news on for 24 hours in their house, I'm sorry, there's being informed and there's being deformed. And if you have 24-hour cable news on in your house, you're, you're asking for trouble. You're inviting Satan in. You are inviting Satan to steal your joy. And you can't have both. Your trust is in man, whether it's Fox News or CNN. Your trust is in man. 
and that's where your hope is, and you can't have both. Your heart will depart from Jehovah. So you'll be like a roller coaster. When the news is good, you're up there. The news is bad, you're down there. And, and the Bible calls you tumbleweed. You're going to be well-informed tumbleweed. No roots. Been blown by the wind on a parched desert floor. Now here comes the blessing. Blessed is the man who trusts in Jehovah, and Jehovah is his trust. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. It sends out its roots by the river, and it shall not fear when the heat comes. He doesn't say the heat's not coming. In this world you shall have tribulation. The heat's coming. But its foliage shall be green, and he's not worried in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. Corey Ten Boom, this is something Shana reminded me the other day. I want to just leave you with this. Corey Ten Boom writes in The Hiding Place how she blessed God, how she praised God for lice. Right? <clears throat> so what does that mean? Um, you might think that a Nazi concentration camp was a parched desert, but she was a foliage. She was an oasis within that desert. That's what this is saying, the end of Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8. That's what this is saying. She was a stunning tree in the midst of a desert. She was an oasis for others. And why did she thank God for lice? Can you think of any good reason to thank God for lice? Here's one. Her and her sister would give Bible studies at night in the, in the hut, right, where they were crowded into with other women. And there were a lot of Jewish women in there. And there were foreign women. And when they'd sing hymns quietly, they'd sing it in their languages. And Corey Ten Boom thanked God for lice because they were covered in lice in that in that hut. And she said the guards would never come in there because they didn't want to get lice. So they were left alone for a while. And in that time they had alone, Corey and her sister led worship to God. Thank you, Lord, for lice. Now, this is a piece in the midst of a very adverse circumstances. And Corey didn't keep it to herself in her bunk. She shared it. The love of God, the peace of God, the joy of God is not for us to hoard. It should flow through us. It should, like a tuning fork, resonate with the harmony of our Lord. This morning was a strange day. I don't know if you're all on Facebook, but check out my Facebook page because... We were listening to, um, I, you're going to call me a hypocrite, I listened to, to Christian music on Sunday morning um, to get my head right, but not what you're thinking. It's, it's gospel, southern gospel. So we were listening to some great southern gospel with a little Lauren Daigle mixed in, and all of a sudden I hear this crazy noise outside, like really crazy noise. And it sounded like birds, and I'm like, it can't be birds. I thought it may be a weird truck that's squealing and so we opened the door, and it's birds. And it was like I was sucked into an Alfred Hitchcock film. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of birds took up nests in three of the trees in my neighbor's yards and our backyard. And so I filmed a little of this. But I had never seen this before other than Alfred Hitchcock. And I said to Wendy, I think they're telling us a tsunami is coming. You know how animals are. Um, I couldn't believe it, so I filmed it. It was unbelievable, but the, the, the sound of it, that's the body of Christ. That's the picture that the body of Christ is meant to be, that you and I harmonize with the sound of our Lord like a great symphony playing their part. And we all have different parts, and they bring different glory, but they're all needed. You hear our guys playing in the morning, take away one, it's still beautiful, but something's missing.
Take away two, it's still beautiful, but something's missing. There is a glory to this. All right, I've gone on too long. Bill is here, and Ken is here. <laughs>